Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, my first poem is for Teddy, an Australian friend of mine who died last year. Teddy's feet, helped by a gentle breeze, lightly touch the ground. She moves down the path where sunbeams dance. A box cub with soft reddish fur nuzzles her skirt. Caressed by angel wings, happiness immerses her very being. Black-eyed Susans, once withered, burst forth in bloom, a celebration of a blessed life. She sings aloud in glorious tones, praises for the Lord. My second poem is The Rabbit's Tale. This happened when I was about 10 years old. Around the garden, delicate petal flowers bowed to the cool breeze, a harbinger of winter winds, which ruffled leaves veined as old men's hands. Leaves sent whispering down the path, the small beast, furry as a warm winter's coat, with ears soft as silken thighs, sat nibbling a carrot in his cage a cage fixed upon shaky boards as dilapidated as an old boxcar. I, a gawky 10-year-old, anxious to pet this lovely creature, put my hands between the slats. I grasped his small tail. He leaped. <coughs> I found his tail between my fingers. A red hole was left. Tears dampened my cheeks. The rabbit would never be the same. <laughs> this is Trickster Coyotes. Two coyotes, coats the color of gray velvet, noses poised to catch the tantalizing scent of the next big meal. Small, chunky puppies, soft, furry felines, innocent creatures, Sunday brunch for the lively tricksters. Two coyotes, brush of tails, dancing in the breeze, feet lifted high, trot along on top of the world. <laughs> and this is wild burrows and hollyhocks, which ha uh, happened in New Mexico when I was growing up. Water, scarce in the desert, is pumped uphill from the San Juan. Water, precious water, is used to drink, bathe in and water the plants. Hollyhocks standing tall grow in front of the house. My father carries buckets of water for them and the blue morning glory vine in back. <coughs> Early in the morning, when the silver and gold dawn light up the sky, the lively, rough-coated little burrows come to nibble, to feast on the hollyhocks. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Bessie, the tan and brown Airedale, sits patiently on the steps. My father shouts, Bessie, get them. Chase them, Bessie. Bessie waits for the right moment, then barking wildly charges. Small hooves pounding, mouths full of blossoms, emitting an occasional snort. The ballot got burrows gallop off into the breaking dawn. <laughs> this one is Isaiah Jones, a child that I taught when I was teaching. Warm sunshine comes through the window and bathes the room in light. The red roses on my desk need water. Isaiah Jones, small with pointed elfin ears, unruly hair the color of coal, hands grubby from garden dirt, clutches the wind in the willows. With bleeding eyes, he says, let me take the hook home, Miss Tony. My reply, well, write your name down, Isaiah. Can you read the book? Let me help. Please, Miss Stone. I will read The Wind in the Willows myself. What about the hard words, Isaiah? I don't know the hard words, but I'll learn, Miss Stone. You'll be surprised. Isaiah learned toad, paw, wind, willows. I, Miss Stoney, put my arms around Isaiah Jones. Isaiah Jones will read. <laughs> Uh, this one is The Call. 
I hear the cow owl hooting, feathered creature of the night, her beak amber eyes, letting me know it's time to go, my time to die. So soon I say, but he is sure and calls again. I feel my spirit lift upward toward the light just after the owl calls my name. <laughs> this was a, uh, is on the occasion of geese listening to Beethoven. The damp, hot air encircles my being, <coughs> holding me captive. I park by the fence. Two goose families, long necks waving, rubbery feet patting the earth. Five teenagers and three smaller brown fluffs are pulling up strands of clover, fragrant as rosemary. I lower the window. The finale of Beethoven's Eighth Symphony bursts from my car radio, filling the air with magnificent noise. Two goose parents stand still, rooted to the ground, not uttering one goose honk. They don't move until the last sound dies away. Then with great dignity, the two leave slowly. Perhaps the only geese acquainted with Beethoven. <laughs> Uh, the next one is return. Uh, my sisters and I went to a, a girls' school in Davenport, Iowa, which was run by the Sisters of St. Mary. This was an Anglican order. And um, my younger sister refused to stay. So Sister Augustine took her down into the chapel and said, Mary, your parents want you to finish the year. And Mary said, no. Sister Augustine said, you must. And Mary said, God told me to go home. <laughs> and Sister Augustine said, no, it wasn't God, it was the devil. Ah. So <laughs> Mary, Mary returned home anyway. We always rode the super chief to Denver. <laughs> then we took an old steam train that my grandparents put us on over the mountains to Colorado, down to Durango. <laughs> the old narrow gauge puffs up the mountains. My heart rides with the wheels. All of me breathes with that engine, and here is my heart pound with that engine. A singing of love for the prickly sharp needles of the Bruce Spruce, the quivery sun gold of aspens, and small circles of snow covering gentian bells, pink floral, and columbine. A return to these spine-backed, sharp, icy places gives life to the soul. Uh, my last one is a dreadful one that my husband wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I always finish with one of his. Uh, we learned that Patrick Henry had an insane life, which he kept in the basement of his house, locked up. Yes, this is true. Absolutely true. This is John's version. The mad old wife thought it quite neat to only look at Patrick's feet, or when she saw the rest of him, indecent longings would begin. <laughs> so those of us who find our life is addled by a silly wife should hide her also in a place where we would not come face to face. <laughs> yes, Patrick Henry knew the way to take the marriage pain away. Hide your wife and lock her in before you start a life of sin.